so good to see everybody. And did you see the announcement video? It's a little longer because events are starting again. I, this is exciting for me. I don't know if that's exciting for, for all of you. But hey, I wanted to welcome back our co campus students. College, nice. Good to see you. You're already here. They're coming back in. Things are starting to happen. And I have the privilege of introducing a brand new family to our John Street Church family. Uh, Rodney and Christy Chant, you just want to wave your hands. Uh, I, have a, I have a picture, if that's better for y'all. There you go. He loves, both of them love attention. So um, anytime you can highlight them in front of a public audience, that's just what they absolutely love. You know, I'm excited. Um, this is Rodney, Christy, Zach, and Brady. Brady was our youth intern this past summer. And coincidentally, I don't think they realized it, but um, his dad was coming to get a job here. So they just recently moved, and uh, we've known them for a long time. They're, uh, they were members. He was an elder at Southeast Church of Christ in Houston, where I served for so long. And uh, so it's good. It's kind of like having family here. So if you're watching online, get to know them. I'm sure their information will be in the directory soon. Um, but he, just like several of you, y'all are starting a whole new week in school. And that's what we're doing tonight. We are hopefully uh, trying to get everyone, as many people as possible, to visit some campuses. And if you don't know what to do, go to the one in your neighborhood. I'm sure there's one close to you. Visit uh, one of these campuses, and I think a lot of our elders and staff will be at several different campuses, probably around 6 o'clock. And uh, we may not stay for a long time, but at least you can go and pray. Uh, pray for the teachers. Pray for students, pray for administrators and paraprofessionals and um, the custodial staff. I mean, just pray that God does some amazing things at these schools and that God keeps them safe. I know there's a lot of anxiety and uh, we don't need to add to that. All we can do and all we need to do is to be covering these people with prayer, hope, and love. Uh, so make plans to do that tonight. And uh, I think uh, we're going to start today by saying a prayer together for our students and our schools. So let's pray together as we begin. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we uh, offer you our prayer. Lord, we come to you, Lord, with open hands, open hearts. Uh, some of us are anxious. Some of us are filled with a little bit of fear about what is coming. But we know that you are in control. Lord, we believe that you uh, have got some good things in store. So we pray that you would cover our students and our teachers. Lord, our um, principals and our workers that are in these schools, Lord, that you would keep them safe, that you would uh, keep them from any sickness, but that you would also just move in the lives of these people, that those believers who are in these schools, whether they be students or teachers, Lord, that you would help uh, your name to be promoted, that, that uh, you would um, just send life into these schools, Lord, because people need hope and encouragement and love and they need to know that they are valued and important so i pray that you would not only cover them with with health but that you would just fill these schools with joy and hope uh, we pray this in the name of jesus christ lord we love you in his name amen amen well we begin a brand new series today uh, called the creed what we believe and jason was very excited about this new sermon series our youth minister but i'm sorry it's, we, I mean, it's not about you man i'm sorry it has nothing to do with your family um i, I thought that would be funnier but it's really not so <laughs> i'll just scratch i need to get new comedy writers is all i'm saying um i think that this is important because we're all moving into a brand new chapter of this already crazy year and I believe that it's important that we take some time to reflect on what it is we truly believe what it is we truly think is most important now the first part of today's lesson is going to seem like a might seem like a little history lesson so I'm, I apologize uh, but I have a point so follow me um, I really think that it is important to answer this very first but very simple and important question. And that is simply, what do you believe? Now, a lot of times we take things for granted. Um, we take, I, I think for a long time we took going to school for granted. 
A lot of, for a long time, we took coming to church for granted. But over the last six months, I think we've seen very clearly that we shouldn't take some things for granted because we may not always be able to do said things. So my question is, what is it you believe? Because this is kind of crucial to our faith. And I'm talking about what is it, what are your tightly held and most important beliefs? What do you believe in when it comes to those things that are most important to you? Now, belief is core to our identity. And hopefully, hopefully our beliefs are unique to the world around us. In the days of Jesus, belief, the, your belief identified who you were and who you belonged to. So if you were a Jewish citizen, you had a particular belief. You were expected to follow a certain lifestyle that set you apart from the Gentiles around you. Now, as a Roman citizen, you were expected to follow a certain lifestyle that reflected your superiority to the people around you. Both of these groups believed that they were superior to the other in one way, shape, or form. Now, the Jewish belief revolves around the worship of one all-powerful God that exists outside of time, a God who created the world. He was here before time began, before the world began. He created the world, everything in it. Uh, this God, one true God, selected Abraham. For some reason, selected Abraham and decided to be a friend to Abraham. And only, not only that, he went so far as to promise Abraham that he would bless all of his descendants and that he would actually bless the world through his descendants. So the Jewish people have spent their life doing what they can, doing their best to obey the words that were given from God and implement it into their life, making it a part of their life. Now, the Romans believed in multiple gods, um, gods you had to keep happy or else something bad may happen. Now, these gods have existed for a very long time in the Roman mindset, but they would admit to you there is not one all-powerful God among those Roman gods. In fact, uh, you were considered, um, I, I guess it was probably good to hedge your bets, the more gods you worshipped. Uh, the more you tried to appease, the more you participated in multiple different gods. Um, the Jews were actually considered atheists because they only believed in one God. And the Jewish belief was seen as peculiar. And for most people in the Roman world, the Jewish belief was considered a little offensive. How dare you not believe in these other things that my forefathers have believed in? Two groups of people, two very different belief systems. But what we see about the Jewish people in history is that they were shaped, their belief was shaped and really developed through attention and adherence to the very word of God. In fact, they began and ended each day reciting words from Scripture. And uh, this is the Shema. We've said this before, and some of you probably can recite it by heart so let's go ahead and recite this by heart this is what it says in Deuteronomy 6 they would begin and end their day saying this hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength this was what summed up their beliefs this is what they clung to is that God is one and you should love him with everything that you have. And this helped to shape their identity. But over the years, that statement began to lose its impact. And the Jewish belief became less about uh, love and grace and blessing the world. And it became more about staying inside the lines and trying to get everything just right. And when Jesus comes on the scene, he kind of starts to make a little bit of trouble because the, the God he is communicating for some of these people 
he looks a little bit more loving a little bit less judgmental a little bit more gracious a little bit less lightning bolt in the hand Jesus is presenting the way the Torah was supposed to be lived out and for some it was a little bit disruptive but Jesus makes his appearance and suddenly people, they start to rethink their commonly held beliefs. And then you know what happens. Jesus, he dies a tragic death and then he rises again. And after that moment, something amazing happens. Stories about his death and about his burial and about his resurrection start to circulate and then people, they start to believe they believed these stories even though they didn't witness it even though they didn't really even know Jesus at all they start to believe because the stories they they were hearing they made sense and and for some reason they were moved to believe and then they started telling the story because they believed it and so this movement, it begins to grow and it begins to, to um, start popping up all over the world. Stories about Jesus begin to start, to, they start to crystallize. They start to, to take shape and, and slowly people who were there next to Jesus start writing down their stories. They start compiling them in works and collections and they start writing letters to different groups of, of churches that are just popping up all over the world. It starts to spread. And suddenly now we've got more and more of these little small groups, these little faith communities that are, that are developing and starting around one commonly held belief that Jesus was real he died he rose again and he's coming back Paul even and in his writings you start seeing when you start really reading you start seeing there's lots of these little statements of belief throughout Paul's writing in fact uh, as Paul writes he says this in 1 Corinthians 15 y'all read it a little earlier he says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and he goes on to talk about and these other things that you know basically he's saying you know these are what we all believe commonly held beliefs but in the beginning of this movement of Jesus followers some things started to happen that were a little bit I will say even more disruptive things that were uh, ideas that were starting to uh, um, be latched on to uh, that weren't the common belief system uh, by the way I've got these in your app if you want to look at your notes I've got some notes that you can follow along here with uh, there are several of these uh, movements that started and these were movements that were not based on commonly held belief but they were crazy ideas and ideas that did not really mesh with what Paul with what the apostles and even Jesus himself had been trying to teach now there's several but I'm going to go ahead and, and, and list some out these uh, are were, were labeled by those early Christians as incorrect and heretical beliefs so let's kind of go through these so the first one that we see uh, is something that was started by a man named Arian and it's called Arianism now Arianism stated very simply Jesus was not divine he was just a man he wasn't wasn't all God he was just a man well that didn't really mesh with some of the things that John had been saying or Paul had been saying or any of these people had been saying then you have this group uh, it's called docetism and they denied that Jesus was human at all. So completely opposite of Arian. They said, oh no, Jesus wasn't human. He was God. He just appeared to be like a man and he didn't really die. So uh, he was really God all along. He was more of a spirit and we were kind of tricked, but that's, he wasn't really human. Well, that doesn't go along with some of the things that we've been hearing either. Then you have people called the Gnostics. Gnosticism and Gnosticism meant that you had two parts you had a flesh and a spirit and they said the flesh was bad spirit was good each of these had its own God 
And it didn't matter what we did with our body because that was bad anyway. It really mattered what we did with our, with our spirit. You know, the more you knew, the more uh, you clung to the knowledge. It didn't matter if you lived a particular way as long as you knew. And it all was about knowledge. The knowledge made you more, of a, of, of, you know, more like God. Well, that's, that's a little crazy. Then you had something called Marcionism. Marcionism rejected the Old Testament outright. They said, ah, the Old Testament doesn't matter. That was kind of part and parcel with a lesser God. In fact, the God of the Old Testament is not the same God as the New Testament. They say that the only scriptures worth reading are the New Testament. We don't need to worry about the Old Testament at all. This was deemed heretical by those early Christians. Now, we still have some Marcionites in our world today that tell us the Old Testament doesn't matter. So some of these things are still around. Some of these ideas are still around, but they're still very wrong, very heretical. They cause people grief. They cause people worry. They're still incorrect. And most of these early church uh, fathers, these early church leaders, the apostles and their followers, they, they didn't believe any of this. They were trying to combat all of this. And the, most of the people back then were illiterate. They could not read. So they had to rely on their leaders to explain scripture to them. And this is why Paul spent so much time in his letters trying to combat these ideas. And you'll see that word Gnostic. You'll see some of these words some of these words in there and uh, uh, in Revelation uh, John writes these letters to the churches and some of them addresses these heretical ideas. But Paul spent time trying to help people learn what is really most important. So at one point, these early church leaders thought, we need to figure out a way to get everybody on the same page as far as what is most important in our belief. So they needed some sort of statement, maybe, that could be easily read and memorized, understood by everyone. And so from those early attempts and on, we have things that are called, these statements that are called the creeds. Now, creed comes from the Latin word credo. And credo simply means I believe. Now, those early creeds, they started to develop around 1 to 200 AD, really close to those first apostles. They're easy to memorize. They communicate the gospel in a way that is most anyone could understand and recite. And in your, uh, in your app, under the notes section, I've listed some of these creeds just for you to look through with scripture references and everything. The statements, they really tried to root them in scripture. They weren't necessarily words of man. They were rooted in scripture. And most of those people in the early church, they didn't have the complete New Testament like we do. They weren't privy to the whole collection like we have it today. The stories were still being collected back then. But what we see, and this is something I want you to to hear, their lives were living proof that Jesus was real. They didn't just say, oh, here, read this, and then you'll believe. Their life showed that something was real. They believed to the core of their being. They studied together to the point where they were living representations of Jesus himself. And they took Jesus seriously. They knew what they believed and their creed was clear. So my question to you today is this. What is your creed? What do you Believe, Because when you ask yourself, what is my creed? We all have one, believe it or not. We communicate our beliefs every single day. And I know that by being here in person or by watching online, you are, you are communicating that this is valuable, that you, you find value in meeting together, in, in, in listening to the word of God, in, in having communion and sharing the bread and the juice together. You find that that is, that is valuable and you are stating that with your presence and your participation. 
But our creed really is something that is not just lived out one day a week. It is something that is lived out seven days a week. So what belief, what creed are we communicating the other six days? Are we as intent on worshiping and honoring and remembering on Monday through Saturday? Are we as intent on love and grace and forgiveness and redemption on Monday through Saturday in our work, at school, with people who wrong us, in our conversations, in our rest and relaxation, at school, at home? And do our beliefs cause us to look and act differently? And do our friends and our relatives and and our neighbors, think about your neighbors. Do your neighbors and those others know what you believe in? And this is another question I've been asking myself this week. Does my belief help others? Does the do the things that I find most important, does it bless other people? Because I have to say, sometimes my belief system is really only one, here to bless me. Is that just me? Maybe it is. Does our creed bless others? Because that's the problem with all those other isms, the false beliefs that we were talking about. None of those beliefs does anything to help anyone. It's all about, oh, I know this. This is what I know, and what I know is better and more important than what you know. I've cornered the market on this, so I'm better than you. They don't unite those beliefs. They're only divisive. And I've been asking myself, what beliefs do I have that are divisive? Do my beliefs really bring people together? Do they bless others? Do they leave people better than when I found them? Or do they just benefit me? And when I look at Jesus, I realize, okay, Jesus is the, right, he's the word made flesh. You know, John says that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and he came to earth. God decided to, to tabernacle among his people to live with us. And this is Jesus here. And even though Jesus was this living embodiment of the word of God, even Jesus had a creed. And you can see it very clearly in Mark because Jesus had been shaped by God. He had been shaped by the word of God and he had been shaped by the Shema, that statement they say twice a day. And so someone asked him, what's the most important commandment? What does he say in Mark 12, 29, the most important one? Answer Jesus is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he says the Shema. And then a little later he says, and the second one is just like the first. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. In the most simplistic way possible, this was what Jesus believed. Love God and love others sometimes I feel like I say the same things over and over (laughs) love God love others but man do I need to hear that I know we do it's the most simplistic thing loving God and loving others this is what Jesus believed this was his creed and you see how that creed shaped those early church those early Christians, those early believers, they sh- this shaped them because their church was growing. And it wasn't growing because they were biblical scholars. It was growing because they believed. It was growing because they loved like no other. Because their belief made them love. Their belief blessed others. Their faith moved them to act and it moved them to take risks in sharing their faith in those moments when they could have been hurt by it. And many of them were because they shared their faith, cost them their life. Their creed wasn't limited to a Sabbath or to a few times a week when they met. It was a seven day a week, 24 hour a day life. And the creed, the belief held by a relatively small group of people changed the world. And this grace 
filled, forgiveness centered, love based faith still changes the world. But it really only changes the world for those who choose to have a belief that is a verb and not a noun. A belief that is something that moves you to act, to live it out. A belief that actually blesses those you know and blesses those you don't. What does it look like whenever we choose to live out our faith? What ramifications could it have? What dominoes begin to fall because of one person's choice to live his creed, to live this love God, love others with everything I have? I was trying to find a way to to communicate this but I found this video. Let's take a moment to watch. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet, oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now, is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met never will. I wonder what what actually occurs in those moments and days and weeks and years after our decision to begin living out our belief. We're already communicating something. 
And in those moments, whenever things are great, we may be communicating that our belief is rock solid and that God is the God of our life. In those moments when things are poor and going horribly, are we communicating that God is rock solid and he is who we completely trust? I'll have to admit, in some of those moments, my communication has been, well, you know what? Sometimes it's better to have money in the, in the account. Sometimes it's better to save face. Sometimes it's better to but I will say that the world changed because people were not afraid to live out their belief. I do disagree with one thing in the video. They are going to meet again. Amen. We're going to begin a conversation over the next few weeks on what it is we believe and we're going to hit several things and my hope is that this week you truly look at what it is you believe and if you are struggling to know what to believe talk to me I would love to share my faith with you we have men and women here who would love to share their faith with you because we have so many people in this room who have chosen to live out their creed and it is a 24-hour-a-day choice. None of us are perfect, but there are those of us who believe. And if you are struggling, find us. Let us help you. And for the rest, make a choice because now's the time. As we sing this song, I want you just to consider what it is you believe, and then I'll close us out in just a moment. Let's sing together. Let's stand up.